details of what each number stands for, but rather the why. With that, I'm going to hand you over to our speaker today, Boyd Glover. Over to you, Boyd. Thanks, Donald. And hello, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be here today on my uh, first presentation on the webinar. So hopefully everything will go well after we've sorted the technical issues out. Um, so welcome to our conversation on 70 20 10. And we thought we'd be a little provocative today. Don't buy the what, instead buy the why. So before we get into that, a little bit about myself. Um, so my name's Boyd. Nice to meet everybody on the call today. And um, previously to uh, setting off in my, uh, in my own space as a consultant, um, I was uh, formerly head of skills training at Dixon's Retail, uh, which encompassed a remit of 25,000 people in the UK. And we looked after everything from compliance training through to senior management development. Um, we've rolled out things like a learning management system from scratch, e-learning strategy from scratch, and also a social learning strategy from scratch. So some, some interesting uh, occurrences, and some of those we're going to share um, today, and uh, hopefully just create a little bit of thought prov uh, provocation. So we thought we'd start today, Donald and I, with a, with a question. Um, and our question is, what is your interpretation of 70-20-10? Um, please um, uh, start answering as you wish. Okay, just hold on a second, Boyd. There, um, we we have various people saying either they have a blank screen or um, we have Boyd's smiling face. I think actually the slides have probably moved on now to the question slide. Lisa, if you're having difficulty, please do let me know in the area, uh, in the text chat area, what it is that you're viewing on. But now let's get on to the the question at hand. What is it? Okay, I've got the new slide. Fantastic. Please let us know, what is your interpretation of 70-20-10? Sorry, Boyd, let's, let's get people answering that question. Um, yeah, I can say if you've got a blank screen, I suggest you, you, you do try to drop out and come back in again. There may be an issue there. But look, we've got plenty of answers coming through here. Um, we've got people saying it's Charles Jennings, which is, of course, is very associated with it. Gurr saying uh, something else. It's a, not about all training delivery. It's a blended approach, says Claire. Claire. Gurr says an idea to look at the right blend of formal, again, the word blending uh, coming through here. 90 on the job, 10 face-to-face, -face, says Gloria. Are these the sorts of answers you were expecting, Boyd? Yes, indeed, and I think that uh, is a good place for us to start. Okay, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, which, you know, obviously this is slightly a diagnostic as well. We're trying to work out how familiar people are with 70, 20, 10. I think we can say generally people are quite... Um, uh, uh, familiar with it, but there may be some misconceptions. So, Boyd, you're going to take us through the formal account of what 702010 uh, stands for? Yeah, that's where we're going to start. Go for it. So, uh, we're going to cover um, three things today, really. Uh, 702010, um, a useful methodology with a twist, and uh, we'll talk a little more about the twist. Um, it's all about social, isn't it? Or is it about the individual? Um, hopefully, give you some thoughts around that. We can have an interesting debate about it. And of course, um, a case study and some examples from other places in the world that might be able to influence um, our thoughts as L&D professionals. So um, myself, Boyd Glover Consulting, I'm happy to be working with the working manager um, who is sponsoring the talk today. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the working manager and some of the things that we're doing uh, later on. So to begin, um, I noted that somebody said uh, it's, uh, it's our lovely Charles Jennings. And indeed, I first became acquainted with the 70-20-10 methodology from Charles when he visited me and convinced me this might be quite a good idea uh, for me to think about at Dixon's. And indeed, it did change an awful lot and, and helped an awful lot um, of the thinking at that moment in time and the challenges that we were facing uh, across the estate in Dixon's. So for those of you who may not be as familiar with 702010 or the principles of it, um, it's a methodology that proposes that 10% of what we learn, we learn through some sort of formal mechanism. And in our business, quite often today, we recognize that as either maybe workshop-led or maybe now e-learning-led training that sort of takes us from a point of view of we don't know something, and at the end of it, we need to know it. And then quite often, that encompasses some sort of assessment or quiz um, to identify whether we've remembered the content. And then we move on to the sort of 20%, the social aspect, the bit that says maybe we learn from talking to other people, people who've got experience or people who are in a similar experience to ourselves, and we share information from one to the other. 
And then finally, the sort of big block, the 70%, the, the experience, the component of our lives where we learn the most through actually doing or experiencing uh, the event itself. And we either fail or succeed, and all of those experiences come together. I think somebody noted earlier on that maybe if you add the 70 and 20 together, you get sort of that maybe 90% of what we learn comes through interacting with others and actually experiencing things. So that's what 702010 is. And as you'll see, there are many people talking about 702010. Uh, many organizations will be engaging you through 702010. And most of those, as this slide depicts, are sort of talking about what it is. And not that many people are really starting to talk about why you would use it. And that's really where we'd like to sort of take the conversation today. Um, so if you think about starting with um, why, and this is some work that Simon Sinek has done in the United States, some of you may be familiar with. Um, if you go on Google, you can find some really interesting uh, videos and also the Why University. Um, it gives a really good context to think about 70 20 10 differently. And a gentleman I used to work with, a gentleman called Chris, once said to me that 70 20 10 is not a strategy, it is a methodology. And that really helped me rethink um, why I was going to use it. So the first why that we came up with at Dixon's, which I found is not uncommon, is that when you look at where you're spending your money, quite traditionally, we spend a lot of money or suck a lot of money into formal training. And in Dixon's, this was a typical example. We were spending about 80% of, of all of the training budget on some sort of formal training. And then we were spending maybe 10% on the social and, and maybe 10% on experience. And those things generally were things like mentoring or coaching, that kind of thing. And as I'm speaking to organizations independently, you find that that's actually quite similar. And that might be a why that you think about how you might use 70 20 10. Another one that I found that is exceptionally uh, interesting is what happens when you take away the numbers. Because for some people, the 70 20 10, the numbers become a distraction. They're, they're like, surely not everybody just gets everything they need through 10% of formal learning or 90% experience. And they kind of want to argue and push against the numbers. And if you take away the numbers and just sort of think about learning as a sort of formal, social, and practice type uh, event. Um, and I put phases on here, and I think you can even take away the phases, because actually it might be one of these things that somebody experiences, or it might be two of them or three of them, and it could be in any, any order. Yet if you think about taking away the numbers, it gives a really powerful why, and starts you to help you think about how you might shift your training proposition and offerings um, within the organization to deliver better results for the learner. So we thought at this point we'd just ask you another question before we get a little bit more involved in, in the why and uh, where we might take that. So our question here, Donald, is uh, what goes into the 70% and how can you make it succeed? And that might even be now what goes into the 90% and how you can make it succeed. At this moment, Boyd, there's always that silence as people type. Yep. And we wait for them. It's great thoughts to come through. And it's a good question because we all talk about the what, don't we? And that people like to pin down the what and put numbers against things. And then, oh, well, how do we actually make it work? Bang. Well, we've got plenty of thoughts coming through already. Um, lots of experiential learning with people, coaching, mentoring, resources is coming through as being a quite a common. Um, uh, thought here, in other words, stuff that people can pull down, and, and more on structure, support, and coaching. Again, Dara says, trying things out, says Paola. I like that. I think, actually, that that sounds very simple, but it's actually terribly important. Cedric says, trust. I think that underpinning it, that's got to be important to support mentoring and coaching, and also a sense of transparency, openness, and trust are, are words that are really strongly coming through here, Boyd. Mm. Um, very interesting. Personal knowledge management, people taking control of what they're doing themselves, letting people develop their own styles, coaching rather than teaching. Is this the sort of stuff you were expecting to be seeing at this stage? Yeah, I think it's excellent. It's some really great thoughts, and um, I'm, I'm pleased to see that people don't want to be misled by the numbers, as Ger was saying. Yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting. And the personal knowledge management that uh, David's talking about, I think uh, he'll be really pleased. We're just going to touch on some of that a little bit as well. Fantastic. 
So I think we'll move on and um, we'll just touch on social for a moment. And one of the things that I found, and certainly I got distracted with um, at Dixon's, is that when people start to talk about 70 2010, it seems like a, a really great way to talk about the exciting topic that is social and social learning. And in fact, when I was at Learning Technologies earlier in the year, I noticed that most people had changed their stands um, to say we do 70 2010, which means we do social. And I kind of think that's a little bit of a distraction. It's, it's very sexy to talk about, yet people use that as their why they're doing it. And it gets a little bit distracting for the business and for the learner. And I just want to give you some, some sort of hiccups that can occur if all you're focused on is just, just the social element. So it was uh, Josh Burson's research back from, this is back from 2009. And he was sort of saying in 2009 that we, we needed to move away from e-learning into we-learning. And I think actually, I mean, that's another, you know, five, six years ago. And actually, I think now we're at that space where maybe we should be thinking about I learning and maybe moving away from even we learning. And I'll give you some examples of what I mean. So I always use this slide for those of you who've seen me present before. Um, I love what uh, Seymour had to say. And uh, Seymour is uh, from the US. And he was the guy who was responsible for taking um, notebooks into every single school in Maine. Um, and every single pupil there gets given a laptop, uh, which was really fantastic. And we're all based on the premise that you can't teach people, teach people everything. The best you can do is, is show them where, what they need when they need to get it and how to get it. So I always keep that in mind. And if the secret of education lies in respecting the pupil, which is a really great quote from Emerson, how is social uh, being used to respect the needs of the pupil, or is it just becoming sort of the next big thing to, to talk about? And quite often, what you see happening is that because the why isn't really quite strong and the 70-20-10 why we're using it isn't quite, quite cemented into the business, you often see targets coming up, things like the social target where people start to talk about 100% usage being the reason they're doing social and that everybody needs to contribute. And I think if businesses set out on a 100% usage target, then quite often what's going to happen is they're going to miss that. And what does that then mean? Is that, does that mean it's a failure? Does that mean it, it, it hasn't worked? Um, there's a really great business out in the US called Triple Creek, and their social usage target they think great performance is if you're getting 30 to 40% of people um, contributing. And there's many reasons for that. And Jakob Nielsen, um, who's a PhD and works with AT&T and, and various others, did some really interesting research on the social phenomena that we've all experienced. And he talks it sort of the contribution uh, phenomena, where around about 1% of people, typically, will contribute something in a social sense. So they're quite happy to be the first people to say something. And then around 9% of people become editors. They're people that will change what's been said, add to it, improve on it, comment on it, which leaves a whopping 90% of people who simply consume. And that means if you set out on a 100% usage target, even if you get higher numbers than this, there's still going to just be a lot of people who wish to consume it. And is it right? personally to try and make people contribute if they don't wish to, or it's not their natural style to do so. And when you think of the diffusion of innovations or the law of diffusion of innovations back from 62 with Everett M. Rogers, and quite interestingly, yes, this is actually him. I've managed to find a picture of what he looked like uh, back then. And um, he gave us a really interesting uh, principle that is still true today, and most people, especially in marketing and sales, will recognize this instantly. And it talks about innovators and early adopters. These are the people who will take an idea and they'll just do it because they really want to. And then you get that sort of chasm moment. How do you get everybody else to want to get involved with what you're doing? And simply setting a usage target isn't really going to be enough. It's not going to get people to come from the mainstream and take part and get involved. And when you look at the late market, the laggards, that's where your 100% target becomes difficult because there's always going to be somebody who just isn't going to do it. And when you then think of training goals, and we talk about, quite often you hear businesses talking about 100% of people are trained. 
I'm not sure that that's really what we're trying to do. And why we might use 70-20-10, maybe why we should do it is because what we're looking for is 100% capability. We want all of our people to be able to deliver on their role and maybe be getting ready for the next role so that the business can maximize its human capital potential. And when you start to think about that, um, it's useful, I thought, if I just kind of gave you a case study. How do you know if people are capable? So it wouldn't be a surprise to you if I gave you a quick example from some experience we had um, at Dixon's with this. And the brands that you'll recognize, Curry's and PC World, in this particular example, we wanted to uh, train all of the managers, some 2,500 managers across 500 sites in the UK, with a particular skill set um, that we were rolling out called Customer Champion. And this involves the manager taking control of the shop floor, uh, particularly in high traffic uh, hours, um, typically in a, in a retail store, maybe from 11 uh, through to the mid part in the afternoon and then in the evening. And it allows the manager to check that each customer is actually getting the service that they require. So that's what we wanted them to be able to do. And initially, the training proposal was um, requested from the operators. We want to send everybody on a workshop to learn this. We know what it looks like, and it's going to take three days. And we came and said, OK, well, let's think about this from a 70-20-10 perspective. And let's think about the learners in this. And how do we know whether the learners are capable? We can send them on the course for sure. And I'm sure it would be a great course delivered by great trainers. Mm, does that mean they're capable? So we applied 70-20-10. And initially, we went from a three-day workshop down to a one-day workshop. And we're able to achieve that by doing some things that I'm sure some of you have done, providing some pre-course learning so people knew why we were doing it and what it was we were going to do before they came on the workshop coming on the workshop and actually practicing the how. So this is what it is, but let's talk about how to do it. And then when they went away from the course, they had some follow-up material delivered so that they could uh, understand it and context it in a little more detail. We also then provided a social structure. So we took somebody with more experience from each region across uh, Dixon's, which 35 regions at that time, and we uh, took them to a slightly higher level where they would be, become the peer support for all of the other managers, so that people had somebody they could turn to who was schooled in the new way and practiced in the new way, and had had longer uh, to accomplish it themselves. And finally, what we did um, was we invited all of the store managers to provide us with evidence of their capability to do this new, new task or new role. And to do that, we introduced the Fuse platform, which is kind of like YouTube for corporates. And while, yes, you can send content to people using Fuse, we were particularly interested in its capability to capture people's uh, knowledge through video. So we actually asked every single manager to record themselves doing the new role. So after they'd finished the workshop, they had four or five weeks to work with their uh, peer, their, their social work. And then they could say, right, I'm ready. I'm going to video myself actually doing this now. And that really allowed the business to see who had grasped and increased their capability and was going in the right direction. And those people that maybe just needed a little more help and a little bit more counsel. And it allowed the regional managers and each person in the region that was the support to go in and actually help those managers uh, get even better. And then we were able to celebrate and share collectively across 2,500 managers, 2,500 videos of how you might do it. And you could see every single person's interpretation. So it was a really great way of finding out whether people were capable. Which kind of brings me on to my next point, which is personalization. And this is, I think, going to become the really next big topic that people are going to need to, to address. How do you make learning personal? And if we think again about the law of diffusion of innovation, and one of the reasons it's difficult to get people to move through this naturally is because the learning very often isn't about them. It maybe isn't what they want, what they need. Everybody's different. And if we can make it even more personal for them, then this uh, curve goes even quicker. So one of the things I wanted to think about was Barbara Harold Carson's work, where she talked about students learn what they care about from people they care about and who they know 
care about them. And if you think about that, it, quite often in business situations, people aren't really sure whether the people writing the learning care about them or know about them or know their role or have experienced their role. And then, you know, what other supports going on? So I thought I'd give you an example from Walt Disney. Everybody who knows me knows I'm Walt Mad. And uh, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. And Walt Disney are always great proponents of doing something which seems impossible on the face of it, and yet they're finding ways to achieve it. And the one I'd like to talk to you about today is involving personalization. Now, in Walt Disney World in Florida, they get something like 58 million visitors a year. And that's an awful lot of customers, or as Walt Disney would call them, guests. And they're constantly looking for ways to personalize the experience for those guests, whether that's welcoming them into the hotel and using their name, those kind of things, which we've maybe all seen and introduced ourselves. And Disney are just about to embark on something they've been working on for the last five years in-house, which is personalizing through technology. And what we see here is a wristband uh, touching a pole, and that wristband is actually the person's ticket and entry into the theme park. And we see there the Disney representative with a handheld computer. That handheld computer is instantly receiving information from that wristband that tells the employee more information about the, uh, the user. So in this context, it might be the validity of their ticket, how many days they've got, are they allowed into the park, etc. What's interesting, though, is how Disney are expanding on that idea. And they've taken this tag, and they now send this tag when you book your visit in the United States. They send it to your home. And they ask you to go onto Disney's website and choose, so it's a purely opt-in, choose what information would you like to share with Disney. And you can enter things like your name, your date of birth, your family members who's traveling with you, which hotel you're staying in, your favorite foods, that kind of information. And if you're prepared to share that, Disney will use that information to personalize your experience. So for example, if you put which is your favorite ride onto your pass, when you arrive at that ride, the cast member will use your name to welcome you to the ride. And they'll say things like, hey, Boyd, thanks for coming to this ride. We know it's your favorite ride. We saved you the best seat in the house. And really thinking about how they can talk to you as an individual and imagine that experience not only do they know who I am, they know what I like, and they're prepared to then find ways to give that to me. And if you think about the learning context, if Disney can do this for 58 million people, I'm sure we can think of ways to personalize learning within our businesses. The next example I'd just quickly like to give you is from a guy called Gary Vanyachuk. And you may have seen him on the internet, a very inspirational speaker, um, American, and um, he runs a business that sells wine and predominantly sells wine on the internet. And he's very brash and very confident. And he has a really great new business idea that he's introduced, which is called the thank you department. And yes, I did say that correctly. It's the thank you department. Now, this is not the customer service department. The, the customer service department, that exists. And they generally deal with things when they've gone wrong. So people ring up, their order's not arrived, the shipment's late, something like that. And they look at the processes behind that and try to improve them. The thank you department is different. The thank you department is charged with finding out how to personalize a thank you to each and every customer that chooses to do business with Gary's business. And they're coming up with some really, truly amazing ways. And if you have time, go on to Google and look him up, and he'll tell you himself about some of the innovative ways that they're doing that. What's interesting is, do we say thank you enough to our learners? And I've taken many e-learning courses, as I'm sure you have, and it might say congratulations, you reached the end. Yet very rarely does it say thank you for doing it. And yet the next time we release some learning, we just expect everybody to do it. What would happen if we started to increase our thank yous and personalize those in the way I've already explained? And a good way to think about it is if you think about email, People don't want email anymore. They want me mail. They want things that are about them, for them, addressed to them. And that's why we've all got junk filters and spam filters, because we don't like things that aren't personal, things that aren't for me. So again, what can you do within your business to do that? My last point on this really is I, Oprah Winfrey has just recently received <coughs> excuse me, 
Um, just take a quick drink. That's better. So Oprah Winfrey has just recently received a degree, <coughs> an honorary degree, we should point out. And she said in that acceptance speech, of all the interviews that she's done, one common factor exists. Everyone is looking for one thing, validation. And what she's getting at there is even when she's interviewed, <coughs> excuse me, presidents like uh, Bill Clinton or Obama, she's found that they still finish what they're in their interview, and at the end they sort of lean over to her and whisper, "Was I okay?" So here you've got the person who's the most powerful person arguably in the world, leaning to Oprah Winfrey and asking, "Was he okay?" And I think that our learners go through a similar experience. What they're looking for is somebody to give them that personal touch and to say, you're doing okay, you're good, we can help you, you can get even better. And I really think that um, as learning professionals, one of the big whys that we should be looking at 70-20-10 is it gives us the ability for the first time to get into this 70 and 20% space and really be involved in their journey rather than simply being something that we give them some formal training interventions when they need them. So the working manager and I were very pleased to be thinking of these ideas, and hopefully you're uh, getting some really great thought. I can see some great comments coming up from these uh, conversations. And the working manager and I have been uh, studying this for some time, and the working manager, I think, are probably one of the only businesses out there who are really contexting the 70-20-10. And they're not just talking about the what, they're trying to talk about the why and bring people into that conversation, A, with their existing clients such as Sainsbury's and others, where they're talking about this in a completely new way. And so, for example, when we move on to sort of my, my final point, which is I think the then has it. <laughs> I like to say that. So it's all in the why. And if you think about 70-20-10 in this context, of maybe some formal learning, some shared experience, some social experience, some practice learning and experiential learning. All of that really, I think, revolves around this personal touch. And yes, you may have more and one of each of those elements at any one time, yet try to base that on a personal basis. And with the TWM, we're looking at pulling these things together. And it may not even be that you need to buy anything else. You've probably got quite a lot of the tools and systems that you need yet maybe they just need pulling together in a slightly different way. Um, and that's what we'd really uh, like to hear what people's experiences are like and how we might be able to help. So in terms of the overall conversation today, hopefully you've seen how we've gone from the what, maybe thought about some whys, and maybe added some new whys. Maybe this personal thing could give us a new why uh, to think about 70 20, 10. So Donald, that kind of leads us to the point of what have people been saying? Most of you talking about the weather and the football. Nobody's really commented on what you've been saying at all. Uh, no, that's not true. It's Brilliant. been a, a great presentation, stimulated a lot of uh, uh, thoughts, and it's the recording, the slides, the web chat will all be available afterwards. Sorry, I've got end of termitis. This is the last webinar we're doing in this series. We will be back again in September. Um, so, yeah, let me go back to some of the issues that were brought up, and please do keep throwing things in. I want to bring up... Uh, straight away, actually, something that Cedric brought up, which is this business of validation. People may need validation. How do we give it to them? In the formal setting, the 10, well, a certificate is very straightforward. In the 17, the 20, how do we present people with validation? How do we make them feel that they've succeeded in what they're doing, or that they, even they've done a good job, even if they haven't succeeded completely? Any thoughts on that, Boyd? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I, my personal gut reaction would be that a lot of this, I think, is, is about how we think about our management. And for a long time, you know, management in a lot of organizations has kind of been command and control and mm. let's introduce the process. And maybe we can just help them just reposition themselves a little bit and start thinking that actually my role here is, is to offer validation and the support and the, and the coaching, which some other people have been talking about. And I think with some really great thought, they would be able to come up with some great ways to personalize this as well, beyond the certificate, some other things that we could do. 
be interested to see what other people's thoughts are. Don't and we shouldn't we shouldn't knock certificates. Sometimes they Absolutely. are tremendously valuable. And I, I know one case study in the states of a guy, a bunch of a hard hat wearing truckers who were so taken with the e-learning they were doing that they were sticking their they got certificates no not certificates they got stickers printed out each time they did a module and they stuck it on their hard hats. So these real tough rednecks are wandering around with these e-learning badges of achievement on their hats. Yeah. Um, Sarah Slade says validation create a learning community and have badges. It works on bulletin boards and forums. I do think we're going to see a lot more about badges uh, in the near future. There's no question mm -hmm. about that as a way of helping people, of, of bridging that gap between a pat on the back which doesn't show and a certificate which can be a bit stuffy. Um, okay, so I'm just going to, to jump back to a point we, that was brought up earlier, then I'll come back to some of the questions being raised. The creating the right culture. This is something which... Um, was was raised it was stimulated particularly by a comment from Tim who said we struggled culturally with people being willing to ask questions to their peers this was in the context of social learning but it could I suppose apply much more widely uh, people are reluctant then to post answers they fear being critiqued and there's not always a single correct answer plenty of people coming back saying well this is a matter of the of the right culture for learning uh, in your experience uh, both at Dixon's and elsewhere Boyd what's what are you thinking about how people can be creating the right culture for learning and yes 702010 but learning in general to take place if it involves sharing in particular yeah again another fascinating point and one that i am starting to come across more and more culturally absolutely you have to really think about how 702010 enables your culture or enables it to change and i think if people are you're trying to get people to ask questions or, or post questions there is that sense, maybe particularly in the UK, I've seen it slightly different in some other countries. I think in, in the UK, there is a reservation that if I put my head above the parapet, if I ask a question and somebody thinks, well, you should already know that, why are you asking that? Or you're asking a question of a peer and you, you, maybe you, you're a little doubtful as to whether that peer will treat you with the respect you deserve. I think that is some of the things that puts people off. And it's that fear factor, isn't it? That sort of false evidence appearing real, if I can use a sort of an acronym. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means people feel it's true. And I think validation and personalization is a way to combat it. You know, finding somebody who is prepared to be an innovator and to comment first and throwing validation at them. In other words, it's kind of irrelevant what they ask. Praise them for asking it. Mm. You know what? I think that's a really good point. Just my own uh, feedback on this from having started up the Learning and Skills Group, which, as I say, now has 6,000 people on it, uh, and it's free. We started off with 30 people that I chose quite carefully. In fact, that was a, that had a couple of full starts, then, then selected 30 people, including people like uh, Jane Hart, uh, Clive Shepard, and so on, that I knew would be really good interactors and very giving, and also that other people would want to be in. So we started off with those 30. We expanded it then by another 10, by 10 or 20, up to 50, then up to 100. But having the right people in the beginning really helped build the right culture. And it may be that you're doing stuff socially with online groups that starting, or indeed physically, but having the right people in the group to begin with, when other people then come in, those people, when they come in, assume the culture of the group. And it's much more difficult for them to disrupt it. So starting right in the first place is uh, a very good point. Uh, back to validation. Um, Tracy Capaldi drew it, made a very good point. She said, we need validation a longer journey, not just at the end. I think this comes back to your point, uh, Boyd. Let's praise people for getting involved in doing stuff, not just for what they say at the end, whether they pass the test or not, because by then we may have lost a bunch of people simply not being able to maintain momentum uh, through this. A lot of interesting points actually being made uh, about uh, gamification. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people backing up and also saying badges seem to be something that's very hot at the moment. Um, now, let's just talk about gamification for a second because Sarah says uh, you could combine gamification and validation. Yes, thank you, Boyd, for moving on. Uh, Boyd, what are your thoughts about the idea of, of combining gamification and validation so that if, if you're doing stuff well, then you move up a, a chart, move up a table? What what do you think? I think I have two thoughts. I think initially my gut reaction with gamification I think is a great idea. We've seen the success, particularly, you know, my son is 14, loves games, and one of the reasons he loves games when you talk to him about them is this idea of gamification where it's constantly rewarding and validating and thanking him for playing the game pretty much. 
and he therefore wishes to play the game more. And when you look at the games he plays more of, those are the games that do that better. It's not just the gameplay itself anymore. It's moved yeah. beyond the gameplay. So that would be kind of my first thought, and maybe therefore it's moved beyond just how good quality the learning is. It, you know, in terms of our expertise, it, it's something else. It's encouraging me along the way. The other side of that is, is maybe sometimes I've seen a slight downside where when you get put into a league of any sort, if you're the bottom of it, what does that say? And it can be very motivational to certain people to want to be top, not always to everybody. And so I just have a slight caveat on if it's just about being top of a league table, is that really what we're trying to aim for? It could almost be turned into a, a rag system within within a, the wrong cultured business. That's, that, you're absolutely right about that, Boyd, and it's something we do have to be careful of, and it doesn't incentivize everybody. Remco and Louis make a really good point. Take Weight Watchers. You've yeah. got points, you've got scores, you've got results, but nobody ends up leaving a Weight Watchers meeting. As far as I know, I've not been to one myself. But nobody ends up leaving a Weight Watchers meeting down in the mouth thinking, oh, I'm not top of the charts this week. Because what you're inspired to be is the best you can be. Yes. So sometimes it's good to compete against others, yes. Sometimes it's good to compete against yourself in order to be the best you can be. And I think Alex has, uh, has raised that point. Mm, um, yeah, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say that's an excellent point. Yeah. I, um, by the way, I have in front of me on my desk a Disney pen. It's from the Colorado Springs Resort where I was last October and I was keynoting with Elliot Mays at his event. Now, okay, I was probably being treated as a VIP, but I was absolutely astounded at the level of service that Disney gave me, um, including this pen being delivered to my room by somebody with a personal note from the guy running the resort, who I then phoned up, it was a Saturday, he interrupted his barbecue to hear me say how pleased I was to get this pen and to offer me services for anything else that I wanted to do at the resort. That attention to detail you're talking about, Boyd, fantastic. Now, how do we make sure that we have that sort of, uh, you were talking about personalization uh, in learning, how can we make sure that we've got that level of personalization uh, within learning, is it just a matter of having a, I, I, I'm not being trite when I say sprinkling Disney magic, magic dust, is it a matter of people being very aware of how individuals are, or do we need technology and some systems to support it? Hmm, good question. I, I think there's definitely that personal awareness, which again can be driven culturally through the business. Does the business think of the people that work there as individuals or, or kind of does it just put them into part mental holes somehow and mm. you know just talks about them as an entity like marketing or commercial or something like that rather than mm. who's who and, and what skill levels do they need I think it's very cultural as well when you join an organization you know what how you start to talk to them when they first get there is really quite a, a statement about how you're going to be treated as you go along mm. and if you hire people because they've got prerequisite skills it's quite interesting when you then blanket them with a whole set of learning that everybody does. <laughs> and they, they kind of take from that some interesting things. Yeah. Um, I think that's quite interesting. We can't assume, just because people don't react, and if you've ever been a manager, you know this is true, just because people don't react doesn't mean they're not reacting inside. And y y this idea of putting people through sheep dips um, when we've hired them because we think they can do the job, it, it must send a message to them. Danielle asks a question what about leadership and 70 20 10 people need to get inspired and trusted uh, before being able to learn and I, i'm not quite sure what the angle on this is daniel so if you want to explain more that's that would be helpful but this idea of um i, I not he's not talking about leadership training but about leadership within learning here and making people feel inspired and getting them to trust what you're what you're doing uh, and I suppose it applies to everything as well as 70, 20, 10 in our field. Uh, obviously, you were pretty inspirational where you were. Um, how have you seen, what did you do, and how have you seen other people be good at getting people enthusiastic about what they're doing and trusting you in what you're doing? Yeah, I think, I think typically from a training perspective, we know that if we can get face-to-face, -face, we can build that trust really easily. I think yeah. it's... it's it's much more difficult when we're trying to do it remotely and when we're trying to talk to people remotely. And therefore, quite often, we just get into the, the what we're doing. You know, we need to deliver this course and this piece of e-learning. We need to track its progress, who's done it, et cetera, et cetera. Yet what I found, uh, certainly towards the, the end of my tenureship at, at Dixon's, we, we, 
when you talked about 70 20 10 with the operators the people doing the roles and managing and leading the organization i was really pleased it was probably the most easiest thing to talk about with an operator that I've ever talked about from a training perspective. Mm. Because in their world, they get that. They know they learned their job, probably most of it, through doing it and experiencing things. And they know that's probably what's happening in, in their various different business units, no matter what they are. And so when you start to then talk to them about, well, let's th rethink what we're doing here and how we might do it, and let's apply 70-20-10 to everything we're doing, they get quite excited because they start to come up with the ideas. Hmm. When people are coming up with their ideas, boy, it, it, some of them might be, let's fr be frank, rubbish, um, or let's say they might not be optimal. Um, some of them might be great. You've got to deal with that expectation. Uh, but also, presumably, people are, it, the ones that are adopted and used, presumably people are enthusiastic users of that because it's something that's come from them. Yes, I would absolutely advocate that. If the, if the idea is theirs, we all know it's more likely to work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and therefore, it's less about training giving something to them. It's more about them helping themselves. And in effect, you start to become personal for them. Mm. A lot of this is about relinquishing control. And I think some of the issues with 70 2010 being adopted, well, some, one of the good things about though, using those numbers is that it tells people that where we spend most of our effort, which is in the 10, actually is not where most learning occurs. And we know also that in the 20 and the 70, we have far less control. Do you have any reflections on the role of control and the willingness of L&D professionals to give it up uh, to allow people to flourish with learning in their environment, perhaps in a way that we don't have much sight of? Yeah, it's a great question. I, actually, I touch on some work that you've been doing, Donald, on, on this around the training ghetto, yeah. <laughs> which, which, which has been uh, re really quite inspirational for me. And I think, you know, yes, the 10% is important. And there are many, many things that fall into that 10% component where it's absolutely the best way to deliver the, the, the kind of experience and training that that person needs. And whether that's e-learning or face-to-face -face interaction, and therefore, those things should be really well thought through and supported through the other, other elements. And of course, when somebody comes on a workshop, you can really think about personalizing that for each person. And hopefully, you already are. And if not, I'd encourage you to really make each workshop individual, because you have the person there, you know their name, and you can do things that make that individual for them. So I think that's great. I think if training professionals don't move, though, from simply wanting to own that and report against that, the speed of business these days means that training becomes even more irrelevant or the training department becomes even, uh, well, what do you call it, less relevant to the organization's goals. And therefore, it's not really included in the strategy of the business and where the business is going. It's kind of the people you go to when you need to make sure your compliance ticks are in place or those well, kind of things. you know, Boyle, I totally buy into that. Uh, saw a quote recently saying, yeah, the speed of this, the speed of that, yada, yada. Uh, rather sceptically, the reality is that we know that different organizations, whether they're commercial or, or indeed uh, public service organizations, are producing more products faster and the environment in which you're operating is changing faster because uh, organizations and indeed consumers react to this faster. And there's a, there's a cycle of behavior where you've simply got to react faster across the board and the traditional training cycle doesn't handle that. I'm just wondering at Dixon's, you must have faced an increased number of, of sales products coming out or products to be sold coming out. Uh, was that one of the things that prompted you to move away from formal or from classroom, I should say? I, I think there were, there were many pressures. I think one of those was, was a financial pressure in that when you're going through a, a large amount of change as, uh, as Dixon's was going through from sort of 2007 and uh, really through to sort of 2012, and is now embarking on its, its next level of change. The, the the real challenges were about you know the money ran out, and so all of a sudden you're going well. We've gone from having you know millions of pounds for management development workshops and great programs sponsored by various universities to we can't afford it. <laughs> Uh, uh, so I'm, not, like that. I'm not laughing badly, yeah. but it's a very familiar story, sadly, at the moment. Yeah, and it wakes you up. And, and I think, I think uh, what I would want to do differently if I had my time again is to not have to have that happen to wake me up. 
I want to be awake before that. Yeah. And so that's why I like the training ghetto stuff. I don't want to be in the training ghetto. Well, yeah, in, in my quadrant, you were in the um, comfortable extinction zone and you suddenly faced um, something where you thought, jeepers, we have to respond because we haven't got much time. And you obviously moved very, very rapidly up to a leadership position, which is great. Um, otherwise, you, yeah, you just get stuck. And sorry, I'm, we're talking shorthand here. I'm actually doing a presentation on this, I think, next week. If you watch my Twitter stream, there'll be, there'll be stuff about it. Uh, let's go back to some questions here. Matt is saying, uh, what subtle tools can we use to evaluate learning discreetly in a social environment, especially online? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, anyway, boy, but what's your thinking on that? Can we evaluate learning within a social environment, uh, an, an online environment? Hmm, that's an interesting question, not one I'd considered before. Um, I'd have to think about that a minute. I mean, my, see, my take on that is that <clears throat> evaluating learning is difficult. It's probably best not to try to evaluate the learning, but to look at the impact of it. If learning is truly happening socially, it's going to be very difficult to provide people with something that tests them at the end of it. On the other hand, one can and one should always be looking at the outputs of people to see whether the behavior is changing. Um, Okay, so sorry, I'm, I'm just, just reading here. We've got a bunch of people um, running, uh, running off. That's fine. I appreciate we're getting forward to lunchtime. We've got probably five minutes to wrap up. Um, Andrew Smith raises a technical question. Is Tin Can going to support the idea of being able to uh, evaluate people and what people's learning? Andrew, I'd say yes, uh, Tin Can is going to help us evaluate people's activities, but not necessarily whether they've learned anything, which is a, which is a subtle uh, difference. Um, <laughs> and Paul Taylor, I like this, and I'd like your reflection on this, Boyd. I only love the contrast between pot noodle learning, anytime, any place, anywhere, and the slow learning movement. Let's hear it for slow. I say let's hear it for both. I, I learn a lot by reading as well as from Twitter. Uh, Boyd, do you think we're in danger of throwing the, the slow learning baby out with the bathwater if we just move everything to try and be as fast as possible? Yes, I'd agree with that. And I, and I think that's one of the uh, challenges when people are talking about social and, you know, they kind of say it's really quick. But if you're somebody that wants to reflect and respond and the conversation's moved on, where, where's your voice mm. in that? Mm. You know, so it's, how do you keep all the voices? And I, just going back to this point of people are talking about sort of evaluation, I, I think maybe it's because we're trying to evaluate the wrong things that we get a yes. little bit stuck on it. And we're trying to evaluate whether the training worked and usually that's because we're trying to test retention and actually if we go back to the slides from earlier maybe really all we're interested in is are they capable and are they doing a great job and, and that can be incredibly personal and i think that's where we can start uh, as somebody who yeah and i think i think you're right as, as somebody who chairs conferences and is always getting people to talk about the latest greatest thing uh, I, I do take your point paul that unfortunately we do tend to rush to the to the latest shiny thing and we're in danger of sacrificing the good stuff that we already have and i think there is a definitely a place for classroom training there's mm. definitely a place for reflection there's definitely a place for doing things more slowly sometimes as a matter of personal choice sometimes as a matter of um how much you know in a domain a very interesting um bit of research that chris atherton put up recently she's her twitter handle is at finite knowledge um, on uh, Learning Solutions magazine, talking about how if you ha have a lot of knowledge of something, then a linear approach is great. You can go from A to B very fast and push through it. But if you don't have a lot of knowledge of domain first, then learning something new, actually having a non-linear approach really helps because you get a sort of surrounding context into which the new knowledge then goes. So it may be a combination of things that lead us to think that for some people, slow learning is a good thing. And I, I like very much Anne. Annie Hurston's brought up martini learning, anytime, any place, anywhere. Absolutely, for those of us of a certain vintage. I wouldn't like to try martini with a pot noodle. I think that would be sacrilege <laughs> on both fronts. Um, is, Con has asked you a question, Boyd. Is Twitter an example of social learning? Um, uh, I think I have an answer there. <laughs> Boyd, what's your answer? <laughs> it could be. Yes. Uh, I think I think there are people out there who do use it for learning, and uh, be, because they're very focused on trying to share uh, their thoughts, ideas, concepts, and and listen to other people. I'm not sure always how many people are listening on Twitter. Uh, mm. It's a fair point. Um, Joe says I think it's only social when you interact. 
Yeah, I lurk a lot on Twitter. I pull down a lot of stuff and also share it on Twitter, and, and I learn from that. Um, but I suppose Joe is right. Technically speaking, really is only social when you interact because social is about, well, being uh, social. Andrew Smith raised a really good point back to the 70-20-10. Much of the 70 and 20 is about raising consciousness. So people have learned and then they activate it and use what they've learned. So otherwise, it remains passive knowledge. Is that something you've seen, Boyd? Passive knowledge being activated uh, in practice. Yes, absolutely. And I think, I think the conversely, what I see more is it not being active uh, or activated. Right. So people spend an awful lot of time doing training. Yes. Yeah. And then actually in the workplace, people go, well, we don't do that really. We do this. <laughs> so the 17, 20 still takes place. They just learn something else instead. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? Mm. Um, and that, you know what? It's a real wake-up call as well because I think we should, we can always persuade ourselves that we're doing the right thing. Um, but if we're not talking to people about what really happens, then we are missing a trick. Um, and Tim says, we now talk about 17, 20, 10 in our workshop. Uh, on developing your potential. This highlights that we are learning all the time, not just in the training room. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a great point. Um, we are actually, though, close to the barrier, and I'm going to have to start wrapping up here so people can uh, uh, rush off and get to their lunch, and also so I can uh, uh, get through my final bit of housekeeping. Uh, look, it's been a super conversation in the chat area. I want to thank everyone who's contributed. Um, as always, I have learnt a lot today, which is uh, why I love doing these webinars. And of course, I love hearing from our speakers like, like Boyd. What a great job he's done. Uh, Boyd, I just want to say to you, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, let me uh, just remind you, if you have, yeah, enjoy the sun. We are enjoying the sun, and it is still sunny in London, I'm delighted to say. I was, I was sceptical. I'm as sceptical as whether it would be sunny. It has remained so. Um, if you've enjoyed it, please let the world know. That's the hashtag, hash LSG webinar. Gloria, if you're writing a strategy, please feel free to ping me. Uh, in fact, anybody feel free to ping me on Twitter or anything else. The um, best way to contact me is, um, I'll put it in here, Donald T at learningandskillsgroup.com. Sorry, that was on caps lock, a bit shouty. Um, that's the hashtag. Will everything be available afterwards? Of course it will. And as Jackie King says, She'll be able to check out the recording slides web chat available hopefully tomorrow, but certainly by Monday. Go to learningandskillsgroup.com. It's a 6,000-person free community of learning and development professionals. Ah, Paul says, thanks, Don. We'll miss you. Yes, and I'll miss you over the summer. But please uh, don't forget that um, the summer um, uh, will end with September. I haven't got the dates in front of me, I'm afraid, but uh, we'll, you'll be mailed. Don't worry about it. Uh, with the dates for the webinars coming up in September. And in the meantime, please don't forget either that if you go to learningandskillsgroup.com, you can check out the June 18th conference and exhibition, which are both free. All right, so go to learningandskillsgroup.com, check out the conference and exhibition. Both are free. We've got um, uh, Ger coming back from uh, Switzerland um, for his presentation, Gerd Leonard. And uh, we've got Harold Jarkey coming on to the conference. We still have some space on the free conference on June the 18th, so it would be great to see that. Oh, Boyd, what's your Twitter handle? I think it's Boyd underscore uh, Glover. Is that correct? Do you want to type yeah. it in? There we are. He's probably worth following. And, of course, I am, as I am everywhere else, Donald H. Taylor. Obviously, without the hashtag on the end, I was trying to type too fast. Goodness me, it's the end of another, I think we've had 35 webinars uh, in the past series. Um, and, yes, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you, Con, in July, in, uh, in Australia in July. Guys, I hope to see you on the 18th, and uh, if you can make it, super. And if you can't, looking forward to seeing you online on the Learning and Skills Group, and we'll be back live in September. In the meantime, thanks very much, everyone, for participating today in the chat area. And once again, thanks to our speaker, Boyd Glover, for his insights into the real world and the, of the 70-2010. Thank you so much, Boyd. Thank you.